Hello and welcome to episode 9 of The Witcher Chapter by Chapter Book Review, where I'll go through a summary of what happened in the latest chapter and give my detailed thoughts on it. And today I'll be discussing Story 2, A Shard of Ice from Book 2, Sword of Destiny. Well, this episode was honestly not the most fun to prepare for because... Uh, as you know, if you've been listening to previous episodes, I, re I read each chapter, I don't know exactly how many times, but a bunch of times in order to understand it and be able to talk about it the best that I can. And this chapter or the story makes me really sad. <laughs> By the end of each read, I just fell down. So I'm kind of happy to be getting over or to be getting through this. Um, once we're done talking about it, I'm sure I'll feel sad again, but I'm sorry if this is a little spoiler because if you haven't read this, then you don't know why it's sad until I go through it. Um, but yeah, I apologize for that if that was a spoiler for you, but you're, you're going to find out in a few minutes anyway, what happens. And uh, without further ado, I'm just going to get into it because I don't want to drag this out any longer than it has to be. <laughs> it's a really great story. It's really it's really well written. It's just, yeah, it's depressing. Um, and then also, I'm, uh, as normal, I'm going to give you a recap of the last episode. I wrote the shortest recap I've ever written because the last episode was about the bounds of reason. And that story is extremely long. And I figured just for the sake of not making the recap go on forever or go on for longer than the summary of the story we're talking about today, uh, I would just give you the kind of where the story left off instead of going through the whole thing. So my recap of last episode is just this one sentence. And it is, uh, we last left off with Geralt completing a dragon hunt that ended with him and Yennefer back together again. That's all. That's pretty much the only thing that's really important for you to know going into this story anyway. So that's why. That's another reason why I was able to make it so short. And um, yeah, I'm just going to go right into the summary and then we're going to talk about the story. So a shard of ice begins with Geralt battling a monster called a Zoigel in a large dump of garbage and waste. After killing the monster, he returns to the inn he's staying with Yennefer, who is getting ready for bed. She uses her magic to instantly draw him a bath. They talk about the Zoigel, and she brings up her former lover, a sorcerer named Istrid, who lives in town, and how she plans to see him tomorrow. After he's finished with his bath, they talk about the origin of the town's name, Ed Gynvel. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that the way it's meant to be pronounced, but I'm sure I'm at the very least close. She says that it's elven for a shard of ice and it comes from an elven legend about a winter queen who'd ride her horse-drawn sleigh through towns casting ice at people who, once affected, would be cursed to never enjoy anything but the white snow again and then would set off in search for the winter queen's castle that they'd never find. Geralt quickly dismisses the legend as a nicer version of a phenomenon called the Wild Hunt known as a collective madness that compels people to join a spectral cavalcade rushing across the sky. The next day, Geralt awakens to find Yennefer had already left to meet Istrid. During her absence, Geralt, who is in a pretty bad mood, has breakfast, takes a trip to the bathhouse, and seeks out the town mayor to receive his re reward money for the Zoigel. His irritated mood doesn't improve when he's approached by the mayor's bodyguard, a man called Takeda, who demands Geralt's sword while he speaks to the mayor and seems to do everything he can think of to provoke the witcher. Geralt negotiates with the mayor, and while his secretary is counting out the semi-agreed-upon amount of money, Istrid is brought up and Geralt learns where he lives. He takes his reward, gets goaded again by Takeda while retrieving his sword, and heads to Istrid's to see Yennefer. Yennefer is no longer there, but Istrid invites Geralt in. He tells the Witcher he's asked Yennefer to marry him and asks Geralt to step aside so they can be together. Geralt refuses, and while the two are both quite intelligent and eloquent in their wit, the conversation gets a little heated, ending with Geralt and Istrid both disclosing that they've made love with her in the past 24 hours. Back at the inn, Yennefer and Geralt discuss Istrid. 
She tells Geralt she knew she'd sleep with him and that she doesn't feel sorry about it, and she's also considering accepting his proposal. She wants Geralt to admit his love for her, but he refuses, almost repeating what Istrid said, that he is a mutant, incapable of feelings, and what he thinks are emotions are just cellular. Yen uses creational magic to make a kestrel, in addition to the one she had already perched in the room, and has it tell Geralt that truth is a shard of ice. Geralt later finds himself seeking out Istrid at work, and the two agree to fight to the death for Yennefer the next morning. Geralt suddenly feels very thrown off by the strong emotions he's overcome with. That night, Geralt is approached while drinking at a tavern by the mayor. He's heard about the Witcher and Sorcerer's fight and offers Geralt money not to go through with the duel, but Geralt refuses, and the mayor gets angry, saying that if it wouldn't upset Istrid, he would have Geralt thrown in a dungeon. Later, he's in an alley, weaponless, getting attacked by a couple of men who are about to rob and kill him until they see his witcher medallion hanging from his neck. One of the men tells Geralt not to involve others in his suicide. He wakes up the next morning in the stable and makes his way to meet Istrid. On the way, he's accosted by Cicada, who challenges him to a fight. He tries to shrug him off, but Cicada continues to provoke him, and when he tries to spit on Geralt, he gets punched hard in the mouth by Geralt's spiked gloved fist. As Geralt's walking away, he kicks Cicada in the face. When he arrives at the meeting place, one of Yen's kestrels is there, and Istrid is prepared to fight with a sword, not magic. He admits that Yen left him a letter officially denying his proposal and leaving him, and Geralt realizes that Istrid planned on fighting the Witcher with a sword as an attempt at suicide. Geralt refuses the fight and heads back to the inn, knowing a similar letter from Yen will be waiting for him. So, they are not together anymore. That makes me sad, because I like them together. There is a lot of ambiguity in this story. There's a, a lot of, there's just a lot of uncertainty, things left unsaid. And I guess you can interpret things however you wish. Uh, some of what happened might be important for character development down the line, but it's just, you know, it's it might be something that in the future we might understand what happened here a little bit better. But there's just, there's multiple moments where nobody finishes their sentence or um, that when Yennefer and Geralt are having that conversation after he finds out about Istrid, they both say something about along the lines of like, I, I, I like they, they want the other to answer a question that they've always been too afraid to ask. And they, they both say like, I'm not going to ask it now. And then they both kind of refuse to give them a, sh to give each other a straight answer. And I think it's kind of implied that at least what Yennefer is asking Geralt, because she says the one word you've never said to me. And I think that word is love. And, but the, the question that Geralt has for Yen, I don't know if that's also asking her if she loves him. Her answer to the question is, at first she says, I can't answer it. And then she says, she doesn't know. Like, what kind of answer is that? I don't know. So I just, it's probably them asking each other if they actually love one another. I, I don't know. What I'm trying to say here is that a, a lot of things are left unclear in this story and I understand that's a form of writing you know it, it's not cheap and easy for the reader to just get these answers but I don't know I I get what he's doing Sapkowski but I just uh I guess the only thing you really need to understand is that Yennefer and, Gar Yennefer and Geralt aren't together anymore with the end of this story, and Geralt has this realization of having feelings. So the story seems to be where he becomes aware that he has existing feelings, and he clearly isn't completely missing emotions altogether. Like he's been angry, disappointed, jealous, anxious, more, more than that. Uh, but I think his emotional range probably hasn't exceeded the common fleeting emotions. Like, he's never felt love or anything like that until now. And he 
he cares about people, I'm sure. You know, he's got Dandelion, he's got Mother Neneke. You know he cares about those people. But like real love, you know, like falling in love with, you know, a partner, a significant other, I don't think he's ever experienced that before. So I think that's why it's such a big deal in this story. And it's it's a it's a really important part of of Geralt's character. Uh, Istrid didn't believe Geralt had the right to refuse giving up the end to him because he didn't believe he had any real feelings for her anyway. And then even the mayor agrees with Geralt that he, he that there's the moment where Geralt's going to retrieve his reward money for the Zoigel and the mayor is trying to negotiate a lower price and he agrees with Geralt that nobody else would have killed the Zoigel, but he says that's because no one else would have been willing to slop around and dung. And that's part of, you know, Geralt having little feelings or a small emotional range. He's not willing, or other people that are not like that wouldn't be willing to do such a job. Um, Istrid and Geralt both say something about how he's equipped to do those jobs because he's a mutant. So, Although his feelings are limited, he does have them. And when he has a big feeling like that, like love for somebody else, it's a very pivotal moment in his life. So although Yen knew she would go to bed with this trade when they came to Ed Gunvel, she didn't seem to have any intention of breaking things off with Geralt and Istrid until after Geralt and Yen's conversation. Although maybe it was also when she found out that the two of them were willing to kill each other. See, that's another thing I'm not 100% sure on. Like, we're not given... We never see any inner dialogue from Yennefer. And I think that that was intentional. But I don't know what moment was when she decided that she was just going to up and leave both of them. Like, officially end things between her and Istrid and her and Geralt. But it turns out... Going back to the last story, um, if you remember, I was talking about, I, I wasn't sure if the dragon villain Drettenmark was talking about when he says that nothing will come of it, if he was talking about Yennefer having a baby or Geralt and Yennefer's relationship, it was all, uh, kind of a confusing thing. So um, if he was talking about their relationship, then he was right when he said nothing would come of it because the very next story they break up. Uh, I do wonder, though, what would have happened if the two of them hadn't come to this town, if they didn't have this um, whole run-in with Istrid, like if Istrid wasn't part of it. Um, I think that their split was probably inevitable. It was bound to happen at some point, especially because even though, even if they didn't come to this town, Istrid was still a factor in Yennefer's life. Like, she has known him for a very long time. So he was kind of thrown into the equation at that time in this story because they were in the town that he lived in. But yeah, I wonder how it would have happened. Like, I think, like I said, I think that they would have broken up one way or the other. But I wonder how it would have happened if they never came to this town. Even though Istrid was part of the equation, as far as Yennefer's concerned, this whole time. But it wasn't until they, like Geralt and Istrid had this interaction and they both kind of found out more details from each other, which I guess Istrid was more aware of Geralt than Geralt was aware of Istrid. He knew about him, but I don't think he knew that they were still sleeping with each other. So I think Yennefer probably has low self-esteem and I think that's why she bounces between these two men who care about her. I think some of this is probably carried over from her childhood when she was a hunchback. And I think we can also get some glimpses into her low self-esteem through her very proud demeanor. I think that her pride that she shows most of the time, I think it's most likely a mask to cover her insecurities. And that's a very common thing. So it's not unlikely that she would be written that way because there are a lot of people like that in the world who are very insecure, which I think is very normal. Everybody's got insecurities, but I think they're people that have a very high level of insecurities. And they're also 
insecure about being insecure. So they do whatever they can to hide it and then come across very proud, just like Jennifer. So I think that that might be part of why she did what she did, you know, why she slept with Istrid while she was in town with Geralt. So I, it's like, I don't want to think of Yennefer as a bad person. I think that she's got a lot of issues and I think that relationships don't, just like Geralt, it, it, relationships don't come easy to these people. So I, you don't really want to be too upset with her, I guess. Not that I'm excusing what she did, but Geralt's also done some things wrong himself. So Yennefer mentions Istrid's theory about where creatures go extinct, a new mutation takes its place after adapting to the human-made environment. And this is an explanation for, for why there was a zoigal just outside of the town. And she uses this to explain that witchers could find permanent work inside cities and towns instead of needing to wander through the wild. So she tells Garrett, like, oh, maybe one day you'll actually be able to settle in a city. And he has this thought. He, he, there, he It's like a point that he makes to not say it out loud because he knows that that's not something you do with Yennefer is contradict her. But his reaction to that in his head is that he would rather drop dead than settle in a city. Uh, but I thought that that was interesting because Geralt has, we, we're learning now that Geralt has no interest in remaining in one place. Before, we didn't really know if that was because he didn't have the option. But even if he was given the option, he would prefer to continue to wander from place to place. I think it's, which I think is pretty cool. Although that wouldn't, if things did work out with he and Yennefer, that might have that might have been an issue, not remaining in one place with her. And it kind of was an issue in the past because we never were given too many details about what exactly went down between them when they broke up the first time. So Neneke says something to Geralt about how you ran away from her. And Yennefer, I guess that that was their first reunion after he ran away from her in the last story in The Bounds of Reason. And she is so displeased with him. And now we know more details on what happened. Apparently he left in the middle of the night when they were living in her house in Bengerberg. So I think that that might have had something to do with why he left her there. Uh, I know that he tells Nanake in the last book that he found her too possessive and he couldn't stand it. But I think maybe it was also a factor was that he was just in this one place for too long in Bengerberg. And he needed to get away. Like, that's just, he's not accustomed to that. He's not trying to become accustomed to that. That's just not who he is. It's the type of person that can remain in one place. He, he's got to wander. So one thing I wanted to bring up was we finally got some clarity on the mutual antipathy between mages and witchers. So this was something that I've talked about a couple of times up to this point. And... Last episode, I considered that most were probably, most mages were probably like Stregobor and Dorgore. Stregobor is the wizard from the lesser evil. Dorgore is the wizard or sorcerer, which I think they're interchangeable names. Um, but I, if, just in case they're not, I want to call them by what they were specifically called in the book. Maybe later on we'll learn more about that. Anyway, um, Stregobor and Dorgore were both all about conservation. You know, they didn't like people... They don't like witchers because they kill monsters and they they create a big problem for witchers in that regard. So I had wondered, because we get to know another mage a little bit better, and that's Yennefer. And she clearly doesn't have an issue with Geralt killing monsters. Like she, that's not a thing with her at all. So I thought maybe there's just kind of a group of mages that have an issue with that, but... Now, from Istrid, we got a different explanation. And Istrid doesn't like Geralt, but that's that's mainly because Geralt was with the woman that he's in love with. So that's a personal thing. But he does explain that mages tend to not respect witchers because these mages study magic for many years. And... 
they it's like it's like a grueling process from that's a very long tedious thing that they need to go through and they're taught to respect magic as like the sacred thing and then whenever they see anybody else who practices magic like a witcher even though Geralt's magic is way more limited he's got his signs the signs are great aren't they yeah they're great <laughs> but they're not anything like what we saw Yennefer do and Istrid do in this story you know Istrid was able to just create all these butterflies just you know with the wave of a hand and Yennefer was able to create a bird like a real bird basically I think I'm pretty sure it had organs and breathed and did normal bird things uh, so Geralt can't do anything like that but when they see other people using magic who do not have the same respect who do not see it as a sacred thing the way that they do they look down on that and that's why mages tend to not like witchers so there we go we got an explanation i don't know if witchers tend to not like mages for a particular reason or if it's just because they know that the mages right off the bat aren't gonna like them but either way i don't think it, i don't think that's too important i just think that um getting a little bit more understanding into where this i don't want to say hate but um the word i used was antipathy where that comes from i think it's um good to just get a little bit more understanding into that which we have only been given vague examples of up until now so we meet this mayor his name's mayor herbolth and we quickly get an idea of what kind of person he is. He's not an important character. Um, I'll just tell you right now. I'm sorry if this is a spoiler, but it's really not that big of a spoiler that you're going to be left disappointed. We don't meet him again. He's not important. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to mention him because he's got some qualities. Like he is a very openly racist person. He's not even a little bit subtle about how he feels about elves. He says things like, um, like a cursed race, everything wrong with the world is the fault of the elves, something like that. He dismisses the death of the children who were killed by the Zoigel as a bargaining technique. You know, Geralt is trying to get a certain price for killing the Zoigel and the mayor's trying to give him less than he wants. And Geralt uses the argument, well, it's killed people. And the mayor said something like, like, oh, it killed a drunk and it killed some kids. And uh, this, these kids' father was, um, or he had so many kids, he can't even keep track of them. It's like, what, really? Like, th th this monster killed children and you're just trying to dismiss that so that you can save some money. And um, yeah, he agrees to pay Geralt 95 and then he only ends up paying him 90 because of the tax. So it, I just wanted to talk about him because Geralt seems to come across a lot of shitty people. Sorry, I'm trying not to curse. Geralt comes across a lot of crappy people like this. And I think it's kind of interesting, though, because it's pretty similar to real life. We're in this fantastical world where there's magic and monsters, a lot of things that don't exist in real life. And... I, I just like that there's a lot of things that are in this world that are similar to real life. It makes the story more relatable. So when we come across things where it's kind of like an implicit similarity, I just think it's interesting. And I always notice those things. So that's why I like to talk about it. Um, and speaking of racism towards elves, we get more examples of that in this story. So when Geralt's going through the town, he's kind of running errands. He sees this writing on the wall. I almost said graffiti. I don't know if it was graffiti. I don't know if that's a thing in this world. But basically somebody painted, we'll just say they painted on the wall. It said elves to the reservation. So they're trying to segregate the different races. Um, I mean, we already know that there are elves that live on the outskirts of society. They live in forests and mountains, but some of them are integrated in society. 
And the ones who are integrated in society get persecuted, get discriminated. We know that from last story, there's um, the same thing goes on with between humans and dwarves. And it just seems like with every new chapter, every new story, we get another example of this sort of racism in this world. And they seem to just be getting worse. You know, in the last story, we learned that they've got these pogroms that happen. And now we learn that they're forcing elves out of their homes and sending them to live on these reservations. So it's not good. And I wonder if it's building up to something, if maybe this is going to come to a head at some point and there's going to be a plot point around that. But we'll see. All right. So to wrap this up, we're really not, we're not left with much to go off of in this story to allow us any predictions of what's in store next for Geralt. Uh, we just know that Yennefer probably won't be around. I am expecting that maybe the next story he's going to be sad, if not a lot of time has gone by between the end of this story and the beginning of next story. So I just feel bad for Geralt. I, I don't know. If he had told Yen, if he had said to her, I love you, maybe they'd still be together, maybe not. But they, I don't know. I think that they both have so many problems with each other. Not like, not that Geralt has a problem with Yennefer and Yennefer has a problem with Geralt. Like with themselves, like these internal conflicts that they both probably need to work out before they can be together. It's just, they broke up once and got back together and now they just broke up again. Doesn't seem likely that they would get back together another time, but maybe they will. I just want them to be together. So, yeah, it's sad. I just feel sad at the end of the story. Because you know that they're both hurting. And I like both of them. Uh, hopefully they'll find a way to reconnect. She had a huge impact on him. And I think he did with her too. We, we know more about what's going on with Geralt than we do with Yennefer. Because it's mostly we get to see his perspective on things. Well, we get to see Geralt's perspective on things than any other character. He's the protagonist. But... I'm pretty sure he had a big impact on Yennefer. I mean, she says so in the last story, in The Bounds of Reason. She says, I've given more to you than any other man. So, anyway, thank you so much for listening. And if you are interested in listening to this, into listening to future episodes on a different platform, just know that these episodes are all available on YouTube with a video component. And Spotify and Apple Podcasts, both with just the audio. And they're all under the same name, Sam Fiction and Fantasy Fun. So thank you so much again, and goodbye.